And you wouldn't think that one leads into the other, yet in fact that's sometimes how history works. You know, you do, you, you undertake an action of courage, and then it leaps, and something happens from it, something else happens from it. And Nelson Mandela calls it the multiplication of courage. And I think that that's, in a, you know, it, it's a powerful lesson to remember, that you just don't know, you just don't know how things are going to turn out. And it's very easy for us to, to sort of, again, frame the future as a kind of infinite succession of, of the current present. And, and, and I, think, I think that's dangerous because it gives away our power to, to hope and dream for the kind of world we want to enact. Now, a lot of times why it's hard to act is that in this culture people aren't taught. I mean, most citizens are not taught to take a stand. They're not taught the stories of parks or of the union organizers or of the populists or the abolitionists or the suffrage workers. I remember talking with a student and asking him, and saying, well, what do you know about the movements that have most changed America. And he said, well, to be honest, we don't learn much. We, we learn the conclusions. We learn that Lincoln freed the slaves and women got the vote and some unions were organized. I don't teach that in the South. And uh, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream and a bunch of people heard him in Washington, D.C. He said, but to be honest, I have no idea how people came to participate in any of those movements or what it was like what it was like to go up against just, you know, Goliath, or just, you know, absolutely impossible odds, and prevail, prevail by persisting. I mean, I remember going to the, it was the home of Susan B. Anthony, the suffrage movement in Rochester, New York, where she lived most of the time, and it's a little museum, it's a little home, and it's a little museum now, and there was, it's the kind of thing you find in museum, letters and memorabilia and, and whatnot, and what struck me most is that Women didn't get the vote until I think it was 12 or 13 years after she died. So she spent her entire life working to get women the vote. And on one level you can say, well, she obviously failed because she didn't achieve it in her lifetime. But that, that isn't how we can to look at her because we can now see, looking back, you can see the arc of history. And you can see that, in fact, the efforts that she and all those other women did, many of them also didn't want to see it, that they see the ground to get women the vote. So, so I think, again, it's that sense of how long is our horizon, how far can we look to be able to, to, to understand how change occurs. And oftentimes I think people, they, they take themselves out of the game before they even start. And there's a phrase I use called the perfect standard, which is the idea that says that to be able to take a stand, you have to be eloquent as king and saintly as Gandhi and know every single answer and fact and have the answer to every conceivable question. And of course, nobody does. But I see people just saying, well, I just don't know enough. You know, I'd like to, I don't know, I've got deep misconduct about the war in Iraq, but I mean, who am I to say anything? I, you know, it troubles me that, you know, the global warming, I've read a little bit, it, you know, it does seem real and serious, but, but I'm not a scientist, I'm not a climatologist, who am I to speak out of? And we essentially give away our voice. And What's interesting to me is that I find that the people who act the most powerfully, they end up learning as they go. It's not as if they have confidence going in. I remember, remember it's kind of interesting, I heard Arun Gandhi, the grandson of uh, Gandhi, speak a couple of years ago, and he was describing how Gandhi's family basically borrowed and sold and mortgaged everything they had to send them to law school. I mean, their land, their jewelry, clothes, I mean, they just, you know, all their hopes are riding on. And he, I guess the, the kindest way to describe him as a lawyer was a miserable failure. He was um, so shy that he would get up in court and he would stammer and not be able to say anything. And of course, if you can't say anything, you lose all your cases. And he didn't win any of his cases. I mean, he just would get up there, he'd be tongue-tied, and, and he was just worthless. And they, they, they shipped him off to, to South Africa, hoping that maybe that would change things. And it, of course, as we know, it did. But I like that because, you know, this is Gandhi, one of the giants of the, you know, last hundred years. Uh, but not in that role of the sort of master strategist to want violence, but just somebody who was so shy he couldn't even speak. And, and, and in an odd way, that gives me comfort because it says, well, you know, maybe there's somebody else out there who's tongue-tied and shy and thinks, I mean, who am I to speak out of? Maybe they're the next Gandhi, you never know. Um, or I, I think of this wonderful woman in San Antonio, Texas, who I... You know, with Virginia Ramirez, who was dropped, she dropped out of school at eighth grade, got married, raised her children, her husband drove a taxi, barely got by. She wasn't very involved, and was just kind of, I mean, she was in a culture where women were supposed to be very kind of quiet and back and uh, busy with their family. 
and just did also just felt powerless, completely powerless. And then one day an old woman in her neighborhood died of a cold, and her house was so run down, the witness would whip through it, and she'd get sicker and sicker, and finally died of pneumonia. And Virginia didn't know what to do, but she just felt like something had to be done, so she went down to a, it's a, this is a network founded by the law of the legendary uh, organizers called the Industrial Areas Foundation. I don't know if there's a Lehigh Valley affiliate, but I know that there's one in Philadelphia and Baltimore and a bunch of other places. And one in San Antonio is called COPS, Communities Organized for Public Services. And so she goes down to a local Catholic church and says, what are you going to do about it? And they asked her what she was going to do, but she didn't know what to say, so she left. And a few weeks later, there's a knock on her door. In fact, I think I just lecture later and say, and there's a nun who's volunteering with the group and, and, and said, well, why are we so angry? And, and, and Virginia says, well, this old woman died needlessly. I mean, uh, you know, she worked her whole life. She sacrificed. She did everything to think about it. Was, this is how we treated her. Just left her to die. And then, then she started talking about her family. She started talking about her father who was a migrant farm worker. You know, what more fruitful work literally could you, could you do than putting food on people's tables? And yet he just got treated like dirt. And the schools that were underfunded, and there was no storm sewers, and every couple of years there was floods, and a couple of children drowned. And she told me on a recent visit, she showed me this sort of culvert where the water went back up, and how her father would beg time off to work from work to carry her and her brother across on his back so there wouldn't be a risk of drowning. And she said, Nobody cares about our community. And, and the nun said, Well, do, do you think your neighbors care? And she said, Well, maybe, but you know, they're as poor as I am, so no one's going to listen to them. And very hesitantly agreed to hold a house meeting. And when the day came, she was terrified because she was afraid that she wouldn't know what to say or what to do. And um, you know, what if she asked for something wrong? I mean, all the usual fears, the perfect standard. And so she said, she described kind of, you know, people are at the door, they're knocking, and she says, she can't open it. She's paralyzed. Her knees are knocking, her stomach's clenching. I mean, eventually she opens the door because she can't keep you go outside. But it's just terrifying. And then she starts talking with them, and, and you know, they show the pictures of their grandchildren and uh, their, you know, what they want in the community, and just she likes it. It's kind of fun, and 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 so she gets involved more and agrees to hold another house meeting. And this time she looks forward to it, and step by step she gets involved. But there's still setbacks. At one point she's testifying for the very first time in the San Antonio City Council, and she just panics. She said. Not only did I forget my speech, I forgot my name. She's blank, <laughs> completely. And all she could remember are these are city council people, and I have an eighth grade education, and what am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be, people like me are not supposed to be talking here. And then she got a little more confidence and looked around at the people she'd come with and told the story she'd come to. And about, about a dozen years later, she finds herself in Washington, D.C., testifying for the committees of the United States Senate and Congress. And on a job training bill that COPS had put together. By then, COPS had brought about literally about $2 billion of public and private investment in the poorest barrios of San Antonio. And she drove me around and there here's the new high school, the new community center, the new business incubator, the, um, the place where little mini grants are given to fix up people's houses and uh, new cell phone towers. <laughs> um, the, and, and, you know, and, and she's in Washington, D.C. And I, and I said, well, we're, you know, completely, weren't you completely terrified? You know, I mean, these are U.S. senators. And she said, well, I was a little bit nervous. I prayed to God I wouldn't make a complete fool of myself the night before. But she said, to be honest, I was so much more scared the first time I talked to my neighbors. I was just so much more scared. She said, I was so much more scared the first time I talked to the San Antonio City Council. She said, by the time I got to the U.S. Senate, I was used to it. <laughs> well, that's a kind of interesting statement, because if you ask most people on the street who's more intimidating, your neighbors or U.S. Senators, um, they'd say the U.S. Senators. But what I think it suggests is that sometimes the first place that you start is the hardest. The first steps are the hardest. 